everybody. I'm Sean Reynolds from Sports and about to be joined by Ken Weeb from the Winnipeg Free Press. Together we are Kenny and Rennie. This is the Kenny and Rennie post game show coming together at the very last second here. Uh, trying to get to you as quick as we possibly can. Uh, what a game. Um, so if we're looking for reasons to believe that there were so few of them, the last game that we saw the Winnipeg Jets play against the Ottawa Senators. Wow. That game. Um, I think is reason to believe you take a playoff opponent like the LA Kings, a uh, team that knows how to grind, team that, you know, plays a specific style of game, a defensive style of game, uh, a team that challenged the Winnipeg Jets on this night here tonight, um, a team that that pushed a lot of the right buttons, a team that created a lot of opportunities, a team that capitalized on its opportunities, and you have a Winnipeg Jets team that fights back pushes back, uh, gets better as the game goes on, starts doing the things uh, that, uh, you know, you need a team to do to make you competitive at this time of year. Uh, great performance by a lot of different players. Rick Bonus went out this game to take his team out of their comfort zone, mixed up the lines, mixed up the D pairings. Team responds. Uh, I got to be honest. I thought before this game, this wasn't going to turn out well because when I asked Rick Bonus before the game, basically about uh, the, the the idea behind the lines that he put together, um, it seemed uh, like he basically was saying this was changed for the sake of change, right? It was, you know, we can't keep doing what we're doing is what he said. So we got to change something up. And I take a look at that and I think, wow, I don't know how well that's going to work out. And I don't know what the mind. Now, if you take a look at moving Nikolai Ehlers back onto the top line alongside Mark Shifley and Gabe Velarde, clearly there's something we've seen there in the past. But moving Kyle Connor down to that second line is a bit of a, a question mark. What you're trying to accomplish there? Well, boy, did it accomplish a lot. Probably the best game we've seen from Kyle Connor since he returned from his injury. I've got a lot to say about that. We'll get into that and why I think that worked so well and why I think it's something we've talked about on this show uh, and kind of a theme that I have thought the Jets have been missing for a while when it came to Kyle Connor. This worked out. And then obviously Cole Perfetti. I mean, wow. Uh, what a game by Cole Perfetti. What a breakout performance. I think hands down, that's Cole Perfetti's best game of his NHL career. Um, and what a what a way to do it, to be coming off of, you know, not getting opportunities and the opportunities he's been getting have been opportunities that really aren't in the spot you would want a player like him to play. Cole Perfetti isn't built to play a fourth line grinder role. I know there's this idea of putting him on the fourth line along Vladislav Nemeskov and maybe you capitalize on some scoring. Uh, I, I still don't think that that's, you know, an ideal scenario. I think the kind of lines that they're going to be playing are going to be grinding kind of lines, which make it difficult for that to, to, to happen. And what you're looking at is essentially putting... Cole Perfetti in a in an opportunity where he's got to play a grind game and he's just going to get out grinded typically. Um, so seeing him back in the top six, what a way to capitalize on his return to the top six. Um, more than anything, I think at the start of this game, you see a lot of really great opportunities for the LA Kings in the middle of the ice. And some of the goals that they score are middle of the ice goals. And I think what we saw there is characteristic of what we've been seeing from the Winnipeg Jets for the past little while. The issue with that is the Winnipeg Jets aren't a team that has built success this year uh, off of allowing stuff on the inside. There was a lot of stuff that came from the inside. It wasn't necessarily capitalized on. And I know at one point I looked at the shots and I was surprised to see LA only had a certain amount of shots uh, early on in the game when they'd been given these opportunities in tight and these breakdowns by the Winnipeg Jets. What I saw though, as the game wore on and on, is that those opportunities for the most part disappeared. I mean, I think outside of the shorthanded breakaway uh, that the LA Kings have that Cole Perfetti scores just afterwards, um, 
outside of that opportunity, I thought the Winnipeg Jets really did a good job of shutting things down as the game went on. They did a phenomenal job of shooting, uh, of shutting down shooting lanes. If you take a look, shot attempts aren't that much different between the two teams in the first period, but the shots are 12 to five, which means the Jets are getting their shots through. Um, lots of candidates for the lamplighter on this night and, and maybe I'll even go in a different direction than I've typically gone uh, with the grinding and repeatable goals, even though there were great examples of that. But what I think is, is an overarching theme that the Jets can really build on from here. I think the Jets have been struggling offensively because I think their confidence with their offense has been non-existent. Um, and I think what they've done the last number of games is they've been able to generate their goals off of those grinding type goals, which I think you have to have going into the playoffs, but they haven't really had a lot of the other stuff, right? They haven't had the power play goals. They haven't had the pretty passing goals, those kind of things that, you know, when an opportunity does open up on the rush and there won't be a lot of them in the playoffs, but when that opportunity does arise, you want to be poised and ready to capitalize on that. Well, Josh Morrissey's goal uh, that is generated by a great pass from Kyle Connor to uh, to Kyle, uh, Cole Perfetti, which then is a great pass in the middle to find Josh Morrissey. I think the big benefit from this game is it may have the effect of waking up the Jets' ability to just score not just specific types of goals, the grinding goals where you get it to the front of the net. Um, I think it makes them a more dangerous offensive team if they believe and have confidence that they can do these things. And still, how many opportunities did the third line and other lines generate by fighting and scrumming the puck to the front of the net and just jamming away at the pucks? It's how Cole Perfetti scores his first goal. The Jets don't really capitalize on a lot of them, a lot of those opportunities after that. But those opportunities are there. So to me, the Winnipeg Jets on this night provided offense in a number of different ways from a number of different sources, even though the score sheet will tell you that the second line took, took care of business tonight. On a night where other lines could have been, the, the I mean, this is a game that had the second line not scored with the opportunities that they had. The third line could have won this game with the opportunities that they provided themselves. So I think there's a lot of reason to be happy with the Winnipeg Jets here, to for them to be happy in their performance, and to take a look and say this is clearly, to me, the biggest step they've taken in quite some time. And I would include in that the victory that they had over the LA Kings, because what I see in that LA Kings game with 40 plus, sorry, not the LA Kings, the New York Rangers, because what I see in that game is not just a great, you know, a game by a, a, a second line, like you saw here tonight, that game was just a great individual performance by Mark Shifley, but it was also a great individual performance by, um, by, uh, Connor Hellebuck in that game when the Jets allowed more than 40 shots. This is a game actually that, the Jets goaltending was was subpar for the first time in quite some time. Um, and so this isn't a game where the Jets goaltending is hiding some of their issues, which you could probably look at that LA Kings game, a game again that they gave up 40 some odd shots and think, okay, it was a tight game. The Jets may have got away with one had Connor Hellebuck not been so hot. This is a night where the goaltending almost cost the Winnipeg Jets. They didn't break because of that. They fought back. This is a night where rather than us say it could have been a piled up score in the other direction, not as close as we think, this could have been a game that the Jets ended up winning maybe 4-2 or maybe even 4-1. Uh, so lots to like about this game. Um, uh, th this, to me, is an about face. This is day and night compared to what we saw last game. That's what I saw out there. Time to bring the man with the best music in the business uh, to tell us what he saw in that game. Here comes Kenny, everybody.
Ken, uh, got some great news today. I uh, got the call from Sportsnet heading on down to Vittorio Rossi for my playoff suits. So yes, sir. Frank, I will be the guy who walks in and loudly proclaims that Kenny and Rennie sent me and asked for Frankie and the boys. They know I'm coming. I've got an appointment, but uh, great to go back down there. I'm very excited. This is Kid in the Candy Store material. And if you want to be like a kid in the candy store, you know where that candy store is down on Cordon Avenue at Vittorio Rossi. Loudly walk in loudly proclaim Kenny and Rennie sent you ask for Frankie and the boys and they will do you up right. Ken, let's get right to it. Uh, to me, um, this is the best Jets game I have seen. And I can't even tell you the last time I saw a game that I was impressed as impressed with them as I was with this one. What did you see? Yeah. I mean, it's getting closer to the template is what I would say um, in terms of maybe generation uh, what they were able to generate 32 shots uh, but to me, it was more about the the, the ability to battle back. Uh, there were a couple loose spots in the game defensively, but also a couple loose spots, as you mentioned. Uh, between the pipes, this was one of the first games in a long time where Lauren Brassois was fighting the puck a little bit. Um, not his best effort, but at, having said that, Sean, I thought his third period was his best period. 12 saves Agreed. in the third period, and I thought Agreed. that he, he found a way to reset himself on a night where things weren't going smoothly. And again, I'm not out here saying there were three muffins. I mean, I'm not thinking that at all. One of them, for surely, one of them was a triple screen that he didn't see. Yeah. Uh, that was the uh, Fiala turnaround wrister. And the Kopitar shot is a strange one. It, it's a perfect shot over the shoulder, but his glove didn't seem, it didn't seem like he was tracking the puck as well. Like his glove was out there, but it wasn't really in the vicinity. Now, again, really good shot over the shoulder. It's in that place where you, you can't really get your glove to. Yeah. Um, and the first uh, one a, a is, guy I used to play with called it the Bermuda triangle. We've talked about right. it on the show before when your arm goes like this, there's a natural triangle there. That's very yep. hard to get your glove there. And it's, and, and you're basically fighting your own body to get it there. And that's right where it was. So yeah. And again, that, that play doesn't happen without a couple of the jets wingers flying the zone on that. I, I love that. Uh, I'm pretty sure that was the goal Cole Perfetti was referencing uh, when he said at least one of those they'd like to have back. Um, and in the Arvidsson shot is, is it's a perfect shot, but it's a shot from distance that you it's don't expect out, to go in that you're probably thinking if you have the net, you are you know expecting that to be stopped. And Brassois would be the first one to say that. I mean, I just don't think that he played his angle very well uh, on that one. So again, Again, it's it's not a terrible game from Brassois, but it's a game where he battled. And the best news for him is that he battled at his best when he needed to be the best, and that that allowed the Jets to to get the go ahead goal and to hang on. So, uh, you know, kudos to him for battling through. And and guess what? When you've put together the season that Lauren Brassois has, you know, you're allowed to not be great on every single effort, especially when you haven't started um, in what twelve. 12 days or whatever it ended up being. Um, so again, it's, it was, a, yes, he had, you know, he had a relief appearance in there, but uh, he lost one of his expected starts and, you know, he wasn't at his sharpest, but I, I love the way that he battled in the third and gave his team a chance to win and led them to victory. So uh, in terms of the jets today, Sean, I, I thought that that second line was excellent. Uh, I, I agree with you. I think that the third line, although they don't end up on the score sheet, uh, they do a great job in terms of generating those types of offensive zone cycle churning shifts that have set the table so well for their other lines this year. Uh, I'm impressed by their ability to do that. Now, having said that, Sean, we should tell people right away uh, if they missed Rick Bonus's post game. Uh, Nino Niederreiter's last shift came with you know eight minutes and change into the third period. He required stitches on his leg, I believe, from a skate cut, and that means his availability for uh, Thursday is you know very much up in the air. Rick was uh, very non-committal. Uh, I'm not going to have to break up the third line and injury may do it itself. Uh, you know, immediately we will say, we'll see what happens there. Uh, but again, I, I don't know about you, Sean, again, it depends on what there's two days between the games here, uh, two full days between games. So uh, we don't know the severity. So without knowing uh, we, without knowing the severity of the cut or how many stitches were required, um, it's impossible to guess if he's going to be available or not. And, you know, Niederreiter is a tough guy. He would love to be in there if he could, uh, but if he can't, 
uh, the Jets may have a decision. We'll we'll dig into that a little bit deeper. Uh, obviously, you were pressing Rick Bonus on it, and he was having none of it. Uh, but I think it's worth investigating what can happen next, uh, whether that's in the top six or potentially on that third line if Nino Niederreiter is not available. Um, again, and, and we're going to dig into the top line a little bit more too, Sean. I, I personally um, didn't love the chemistry. I understand there are some analytics that suggest expected goals were were at a decent pace for that line. I didn't see that being generated personally. And through two periods, Mark Scheifele had zero shots on net and zero shot attempts. And Nikolai Ehlers had zero shots on goal and two shot at, or three shot attempts. Uh, one of them was a wide right field goal that was way over the net, might've been tipped. Uh, but I, I didn't love, it wasn't, it wasn't just snap your fingers and December is here. But having said that, I don't expect that to be the case. And I'm not not advocating to break them up immediately because they didn't suddenly have five, you know, five points each in the game. Uh, but what I am saying is that I thought, again, Gabriel Velarde was the best player in his line today. Uh, I thought he was excellent, very involved, Sean. Uh, while his line mates weren't generating much offensively in terms of shot generation, Gabriel Velarde, four shots on net, seven shot attempts, uh, two hits in 1818 of ice time. And I'm telling you right now, Sean, uh, Rick Bonus told Paul Edmonds in the pregame interview on CGOB today, the plan was for Gabriel Velarde to play about 11 or 12 minutes on Saturday, but he's done such a great job in his conditioning that on consecutive nights after missing 15 games, he's played 18 plus both of those games. That's big news for the Winnipeg Jets, Sean. So again, we're going to dig in a little bit more to the top line. Uh, obviously, it wasn't their most productive effort, but you know, there's some signs that would lead you to believe it could be coming. Uh, we know Tyler Toffoli was out due to illness today. Um, you know, Cole Perfetti, you mentioned, had a great game. I'm going to tell you, Sean, I sat down with Cole this morning. Uh, I was curious when he came off the ice early. Everyone wondered if he was just a placeholder and if Toffoli was just, you know, taking an optional in the morning, uh, which again is a little bit odd after a day off, but still, you never know. Uh, Cole told me he was really excited about how he had played previously before he was back to being a healthy scratch. Um, you know, he played with a lot of confidence in the last game that he suited up in. I thought he made some nice plays along the boards, looked for a shot a little bit more, and he he went into the game feeling confident. Then he went out and played a confident game. So that was very important for him in terms of what it could mean long term for him. We don't know what that's going to mean exactly, but he put himself in position. Um, and even if Rick Bonus was having none of it, you and I are having plenty of it, Sean. He put himself oh, yeah. in position where he's under consideration for not just token fourth line minutes uh, when it comes to games that matter the most. And again, um, we'll get into the D pairs a little bit more, but uh, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to step back from the buffet after that. Okay. Uh, I, I wanted to start with, with the third line just quickly. Um, what you, you had talked about it and some of the, the, um, uh, the, the momentum that they build. I'd had a conversation with Rick bonus um, before the last game and asked him, because if you remember, we talked about it on this show, uh, how that third line would go out and just halt the momentum of the other team or, you know, build some momentum for the jets. And I kind of asked him where that had gone. And Rick bonus's belief was that hadn't gone anywhere with the third line, that the other lines that came out after that line were failing to build on the momentum that they were building. I thought tonight was a night where the, the team did build on that. That line, so Elliot Friedman's coming into town to do some work. Um, hit one of his producers, I sat with and watched the game tonight. So I always like was sitting with Sportsnet folks who come into town and it's their first look at the Jets and kind of explaining, okay, this is what they're doing now. This is what it looks like when they're doing well. One of the things the Jets did really great tonight was you know kind of scrum the puck on the wall and just fight for every single puck i know a lot of people are t talking about 55 but uh here true north ducky i thought had this right 55 was working hard all night he was a beast on the boards and i was saying to you know, the sports that producer, producer that's something i don't think the national media really talks about uh or or sorry the hockey world i should say because i am the national media and i'm talking about it right now but but the hockey world i don't think gives enough credit to how hard mark shifley is to get the puck off of on Agreed. the board how well he holds things in 
But um, the, the producer walked in and saw the way that the third line was ragging the puck and just creating those opportunities all night long. And he was kind of wowed by it, especially because they were doing it against the top line of, of the, you know, Anse Kopitar's line uh, of the LA Kings. They really neutralized them almost every time they were on the ice against them. Now Kopitar scores that goal. It's like you'd said, they get out on against that second line and that's how that goal happens. But yeah. other than that, what an eraser that third line was tonight. And yes, they got the puck to the front of the net quite often, created a bunch of opportunities. This is a night where if the puck had gone and been bouncing for them, they could have had two or three. Nino Niederreiter uh, robbed by Talbot at one point um, with, with that, that sliding pad save. Yeah. But, to me, if you're looking for signs of being really happy about the Jets' chances going forward, one of the things you have to be happy about is the third line tonight was the eraser of the other team's best line, created a lot of scoring opportunities, but the most important thing um, were followed by the rest of the team who looked at the blueprint that they laid down and followed that blueprint. That's something that that it, Rick Bonus has to be extremely happy about uh and what a bit of a bummer it is that um that Nino Niederreiter gets lost uh good good eye by that uh producer from from Sportsnet who was in who noticed the looked like he 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 thought it was a another player's blade had cut Nino Niederreiter and how he'd gone off straight away uh so hopefully that is a surface cut and not right. much deeper than that because that could be problematic if were that the case and no one or their dog, no one except for Ken Weeb wants to break up that third line. So uh, hopefully the injury doesn't do it for you, Ken. I don't know. They, I'm going to have to check your place and see if there's any voodoo dolls in there with slashes to the back of the leg as Ken's trying to get uh, some kind of opportunity to back up his uh, break up the third line claim. But uh, it, are you seeing the same thing I saw from that third line, Ken? Yeah, that's why I mentioned it. I agree. Yes, they were very good. Uh, yeah. Nina Ryder, great chance. Uh, again, a lot of people are looking around and saying, oh, that line, third line's not producing, right? Adam Lowry hasn't scored in 13, and I think it's 14 now for Nita Ryder. Uh, but they're generating. And when you generate, you get opportunities for yourself and for others. Um, interesting, sort of just an oddball stat. All three of those players, 33 points apiece, adding up to 99. Uh, they've had a very strong season together. And yeah, I mean... The only thing breaking up this line right now is the potential of the injury bug, but uh, I mean we'll we'll know more about that on uh, on Thursday on Thursday morning, I guess, at the morning skate. Uh, no, I, I loved everything about that line, and just to con you know just to sort of settle things down. And I, I agree with you. I, I I didn't once say that Mark Shifley wasn't working hard today. I thought he was working hard. That line was working hard. It just didn't come very naturally for them in terms of scoring chance generation and you know they didn't generate a ton off the rush but uh, like I said I want to see them together a little bit longer uh, there are going to be some other decisions coming and you know let's let's dig into that uh, and we'll dig into that beer league mentioned love the end of the game beautifully classy um, a salute to Ryan Galloway the longtime linesman uh, from Winnipeg here um, more than 1400 games in the NHL and today was his last game and a real touching moment at the end of the game where um, all the players, you know, went out and saluted him. And I believe he got jerseys from both Andre Kopitar and Adam Lowry. Really great words from both Josh Morrissey uh, and Rick Bonus after the game. And, you know, uh, it, our province has produced a lot of excellent hockey players over the years, Sean. But there, you know, there have been some great officials as well, but they don't produce them at, at nearly as high a level. Um, Ryan has been in the, you know, did it the hard way made it to the NHL and had a long career there. And you heard Rick talk about it, uh, the consistency and the high level that he worked at. And you heard Josh talk about just the positive demeanor that uh, that Ryan brought to the rink, how he was very approachable. Uh, I thought that was a real touching moment. And, and as I was making my way to the Jets room, Sean, um, I stopped by the the hallway there. Ryan had, was still on the ice and, you know, hugging some people that were important to him. I didn't see him come completely off the ice, but, uh, you know, he's given high fives, uh, high fives to people uh, on his way off. There's tons of family members, you know, waiting around to see him. And uh, for him to be able to get a salute like that, we know that it's one of the most thankless jobs in all of sports. 
uh, and they often take a lot of heat. But uh, hearing the way that Josh Morrissey talked about him, uh, I would say that uh, anyone officiating their last game, uh, if Ryan hears those words that Josh said, I mean, that's got to warm your heart. Uh, you could tell the ovation meant a ton to him and, uh, you know, stick taps to Ryan Galloway for uh, just an incredible career that uh, came to a close today. I know we're a Jets podcast and I know people want to focus on that. And the Jets did a really good job of honoring him on this night and pointing out the idea that he's from Winnipeg. But to me, the way that Anze Kopitar, one of the best winners of his generation, um, responded uh, and just wanted time with him. And it, like it, you could tell this wasn't a token, hey, great job, here's a jersey, yeah. move on. Like it, it almost got to the point where it almost felt uncomfortable how long the Winnipeg Jets had to wait uh, for their opportunity to show some love to Ryan Galloway because of Anze Kopitar and the love fest that he was having with him. Uh, hey, you're talking about a guy who started doing this before the rise of that LA Kings team. That was, you know, one of the best teams of a decade. Um, Anze Kopitar, the fact that, th that, uh, he, he would respond like this and, you know, there's going to be a lot of refs around the league, a lot of officials that would, you know, get that kind of love from players. But I can tell you this right now, uh, Anze Kopitar would have heard about this being Ryan Galloway's last game. And that would have meant something to him at some point. And the organization would have wanted to show that. And I just think beyond, beyond the idea of like standing there, thanking him for his service, shaking his hand and handing him a Jersey on uh, Anze Kopitar acted like he didn't want his time with Ryan Galloway to end. Uh, and I thought Ryan Galloway handled it so classy, but this is just an example. Like you'd said, if we talk about all the hockey players that come out of this area area, this is someone to be proud about someone who had an effect that fans don't always see, uh, usually don't see. And usually if you are noticing the officials, it's in a negative uh, uh, light um, for all the people who chant refs, you suck over the years you should be ashamed of yourself in this case on this night feel, feel a little shame for uh, always attacking the officials so quickly because probably there's been a time when you attacked ryan galloway if you want to see how the players feel about someone and the work that they put in the effort that they put in and the accountability that they hold themselves to ryan galloway is a perfect example of that um before we do move on uh, i want to get back to the first line that you were talking about there and I think you 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 touched on this, but I I would give the first line, especially with a player who has uh, um, uh, just come back in in Gabe Velarde. I would give it a little bit more time. I thought they looked good in the way that they scrummed. Were they generating the offense that the other line uh, other lines were capable of doing on this night? No, it didn't happen. Did it look like they were a little bit disjointed uh, and three kind of moving parts that weren't, you know, locked in together. No doubt. Um, but I mean, basically, uh, Rick bonus had said Nikolai Ehlers is moving up to that line because he was one of the few guys going and got that second line going. Yep. Nick Ehlers is the fixer in this case. And believe me, they have bought enough goodwill from what happened when they got together earlier this season i've got all the time in the world to see if they can recapture that uh especially with the other lines taking care of their business so i take a look at the first line um and i think uh i i don't think they overly harmed themselves uh at various points in the night i think they did a lot of things uh that helped create momentum for this team so um I, it was said really well to me by Jacques Martin the other day when we were talking about Tim Stutzla uh, and he'd said about him, you know, this is a guy who had not like, think about this, Ken, like the greatest season that, uh, that um, uh, Blake Wheeler had here in Winnipeg was a 91 point season. Tim Stutzla already has a 90 point season in his career with the Ottawa Senators, um, a team that can really get zoned in on. And you got to think Tim Stutzla is facing the best competition that other teams have when they come rolling into town. There's nowhere to hide for him on that roster. So to, for him to be that kind of player, what Jacques Martin said about him was he needs to learn to manage his emotions better. He needs to be the kind of player that's some nights in the NHL, the other team's just not going to let you score. 
And on those nights, you need to find another way to contribute and definitely be defensively. I think this is one of those nights where, yeah, it wasn't clicking and it wasn't instant fireworks by that line, a line that provided a lot of fireworks in the past. But they did the other parts of the game right for the most part on this night. I'm not saying that they were perfect or 100%. I thought the Jets overall were loose and provided too much opportunity to the LA Kings that they just didn't capitalize earlier on in the game. But I saw enough from this line and the way that they were working that even if they're not providing offense, I can live with what they're doing if that's what it looks like, what they're doing uh, in the meantime before they do get their sea legs under them offensively. For sure, but I mean, it was not pretty. It was shots for and against were eleven to one with that line on the ice at five on five today, and it's just a reminder that it it just wasn't going to it wasn't a snap your fingers and it was going to happen automatically situation uh, for them. But like I said, I, I like you would like to see more of that line together. I think they have the potential to be great. We know they were great for a good chunk of December when Kyle and and parts of January and when Kyle was out. Stick with them. Uh, obviously, you know, Rick Bonus talked about it the morning skate. And yes, I believe that, um, you know, some of that stubbornness that we've been hearing about, I think that the Jets relented a little bit and just wanted to give it a shot. And it's worth trying a little bit longer here. And because the second line was able to generate a little bit more, and yes, we understand they were on, on the ice for two goals against, um, but, you know, they generated their offense too. So they got more than they gave up. Uh, and that's important. And one of those guys who got more than he gave up was Kyle Connor, even though, you know, was it his strongest game defensively? No, but Kyle Connor had three assists. He got involved offensively. He needed to. All right. Just he, before, he, before we go there, uh, you're just jumping uh, topics here quickly. Uh, so here, I'm going to do this quick uh, because it was asked for by T. Will. I'm going to turn this into uh, uh, Sean's headband version of the Kenny and Rennie show. Let's do that. And then let's get into some business. <laughs> Um, I want you to give Sweet Lou a shout out before we go too far because Cambrian and uh, Pristine are going to dovetail nicely into the second line conversation. Beauty. Uh, for those of you who have a realty needs you'd like to have met, contact our main man, Lou Ferlin at Royal LePage Dynamic Realty, 204-791-9971 or at the office, 204-989-5000. Tell him Kenny and Rennie sent you. His email is lou at louferlin.ca. That's L-O-U at L O U. F U R L A N dot C A Lou Ferlin, excellent realtor, excellent human being and excellent supporter of this community, including our podcast for which we are grateful. Just to the point about, uh, as we close out the first line conversation, you're saying, you know, you'll give it some more time or whatever. Like to me, th this is, I think that the first line conversation is almost a moot point because the third line, as they played tonight are playing the way you need to put them to play to shut down some of the stars of the other teams into the playoffs. So you're not going to mess with that. And you can't really mess too much with what the second line is able to start producing. So you got to give time to other lines to get it going because you're not going to break up other lines that are working to try and get something going with that first line, which brings us to the second line uh, and Cole Perfetti jumping on that line. What do you think worked so well with them tonight, Ken? Yeah, confidence. Yeah, and there were a couple hiccups defensively, no doubt. Cole talk about, talked about them openly. Uh, so did Rick Bonus. But again, they, they also were able to generate and, you know, so sh show some cohesion. Uh, I thought that Cole played a confident game. I also thought that his feet were moving. He had his feet moving. I thought he got involved offensively, got some early touches, um, showed, you know, we've talked about his shot before, uh, getting his shot off. He was looking for his shot. And yes, he did say that he was keeping the game pretty simple, um, you know, to his line mates prior to the game itself. But it just felt like he was, he went into the game with confidence and he played with confidence. And um, the pass that he makes to Josh Morrissey is absolutely all world again. Really nice play by Kyle Connor. Nice saucer pass, lands flat, but Perfetti's vision to find Josh Morrissey as the trailer is just absolutely elite. It was one of those classic examples, Sean, we've talked about it all year long, where Mark Shifley turns and points to Josh Morrissey uh, immediately after the play. Josh had a massive celebration, and then you could tell he was like, he basically was looking like, wow, that that is a 
high level cerebral pass from a young player who, you know, had produced very little offense, had his confidence shaken and had been a regular healthy scratch uh, for a lot of the last month and has not been afraid uh, to share his emotions about how he's dealt with those uh, tough times and good for him to battle through. Uh, I just really liked a lot of what Cole brought to the table, Sean. Um, you know, he finishes with, let's have a look here, three shots on net and a hit in 1447 of ice time, 20 minutes, including just 36 seconds on the power play. His goal came, you know, two or three seconds after the minor expired. Um, and again, the Jets gave up, you know, two good scoring chances on that power play against. Um, one of them was blocked by Josh Morrissey and the other was a Trevor Moore. I know some folks have been saying in the chat, may, maybe you had a better angle on it than I did. I thought Moore airmailed the net. I don't think Persuade got a piece of it. Did you? No, he air, he airmailed it. Yeah. That's yeah, that, all he that, gave him. And he gave, he didn't no, even no, give the post to shoot at. Fair. But I mean, that's a, that's a glorious chance. The Jets cannot be affording to give up in that scenario. Uh, but they, it didn't, oh, yeah. didn't, didn't yeah. hurt them and it, they cashed in at the other end. So, uh, you know, that's, you only worry about what ends up on the scoreboard, but that's something that in the uh, in the power play meeting on uh, Wednesday when they're back at practice, that's that's going to be something where Brad Lauer is saying, "Hey, uh, this cannot be happening in terms of what you're giving up. Uh, you can't be giving up shorthanded breakaways in a tie game when you've been, you know, given an opportunity, you know, on that holding minor Victor Arbitson where he grabbed the stick of Morgan Barron in the slot there." But um, yeah, I, I loved everything that I saw from Perfetti. Uh, is it going to be enough, Sean, uh, to keep him on that second line? I mean, let's just put it this way. If, if you know, let's just work under, we're not assuming anything, but if Nino Niederreiter needs a one-day, one-game break because of the injury, do you put Tyler Toffoli on the line with Adam Lowry and Mason Appleton, and do you consider keeping Cole Perfetti uh, on the second line with Sean Monahan and Kyle Connor, or no? I mean, I, I do. Um, but he, here, here's the thing. Uh, I, I'm going to go just larger scale because I don't sure. want to just hold it to um, that that one scenario. Uh, to me, um, I want to get into the overarching theme of Cole Perfetti and what can help. So right off the bat here, Cole Perfetti had a great night. And he showed what he's capable of doing here. Uh, and a lot of people, someone had said earlier on, I don't know if I mentioned it or I put it uh, uh I didn't star it, but um, uh, someone had said Cole Perfetti should never see the press box again. Like, let's pump the brakes <laughs> on this whole thing here. Like, Cole Perfetti had a really great game here tonight. One great game doesn't mean that a guy can't be taken out of the lineup, and this changes everything. And and to be honest with you, that's essentially what I felt Rick Bonus said in response to my question here tonight, Ken. Uh, yeah. and, and I'm going to get into it because I, I'm going to try and like gather the layers of all of this and, and where I think it should go. So the whole Cole Perfetti on the fourth line thing, I don't think it works. Okay. Um, I know that the idea is that you're going to add him in, you're going to put it beside the Nemesnikov. There's going to try and be like a little bit of a spark and Hey, that line's going to outscore your other lines. I don't think it's worked out that way because I think for the most part, as good as the is, um, and has that offensive flair when he goes up the lineup, when Morgan Barron is there and the are there, they're playing a very direct game. That is not the kind of game that Cole Perfetti plays. Cole Perfetti plays a game that's not, let's get get to the puck to the net as fast as we possibly can. It's change pace, kind of catch uh, opposition in bad spots and, in, you know, in, in that gray area. And you saw him do that tonight. You saw him talk about getting, you know, the, needing the time to get in behind the defender for Kyle Connor to give him that puck. Because then once he gets that puck, it turns everybody's eyes towards where he is down in the corner. And now he can go from low to high and he can find uh, Josh Morrissey and boom, it's in the back of the net. And then with that next goal that he scores, the game winner, this is one of those things where it's just, it's just that slight change of pace, right? Neil Pionk's got the puck and then he drops it. So your defender is following Neil P Pionk and then the puck drops back and then they have to like slowly take go out of the rhythm that they were in and Cole Perfetti feasts on that little change in pace that change in rhythm and he scores in that situation that's not how Nemestikov and and uh, uh Baron play 
on that line. They play a grinding game, and what happens is Cole Perfetti just gets out grinded. So I don't think that works there. I know they try to get him in there and try and get that to work. I don't see that as being an over. It may work once or twice, and maybe that's all you need, but I don't see it being an overarching theme that works. So right now, uh, works into the playoffs I'm talking about. So right now, what you're looking at is the Jets basically have a competition for the 12th forward. And sometimes it's Gus, and sometimes it's Perfetti, and so on and so forth. We know the players that go in there. Sometimes it's Kapari. I don't know that that's a competition that Cole Perfetti should be part of. What I think is was clear tonight is Cole Perfetti can work and can change things up and can find ways to make things work in the top six. And what I would suggest is there is a possibility if you take a look around the league at some of the players that come in and out of the lineup, if you're trying to get people moving, if you're trying to get people motivated, people got motivated here tonight because of the changes. Um but I think that there that there should be a top six competition and there should be a bottom six competition. And the bottom six competition is essentially between guys like Gustafson getting into the lineup, uh, uh, Kapari, if you bring up AJF, guys like that. And that what you should be doing is trying to say, okay, well, what are we looking for? And then maybe one of your top six guys comes out at some point if they're not performing properly, especially because what we've seen from this team down the stretch has been in some of their top guys not giving their all-out effort, if they know that there's an, actually a chance that they can end up in the press box and a guy like Cole Perfetti is waiting to jump in there, then I think that there's a little bit of a more of a motivation aspect. And I've said this before, this competition for the seventh defenseman and for the 12th forward, it only affects a certain amount of guys. It doesn't affect anyone outside of, you know, the four forwards who are trying to get into that spot or the three defensemen who are trying to get into that spot. It doesn't affect the guys up the lineup. We've heard people talk about it in our chat room like crazy. It doesn't affect Neil Pionk. Neil Pionk is not going to be with the one of the guys who gets pulled out of the lineup because of that competition. A lot of people want that, but that's not the way it's going to work. So I would suggest that's something. And I asked that question of Rick bonus. You talked about him saying he didn't want to answer the question. I don't think he wants to answer the question because it's not true. I don't think Tyler Toffoli is coming out of the lineup because he got sick one night and now he's going to be out. And and th this is on the assumption that Niederreiter gets back, which I think is the more interesting conversation. I don't think Tyler Toffoli, they give up a second and a third round pick for him. They bring him in a guy that they'd maybe want to re-sign and they send him yeah. the message, hey, you're going to be out of the lineup because you had a bad game and this young kid came in and had a good one. All the people out there who are saying this now is Cole Perfetti and this is what Cole Perfetti is going to be going forward. Cole Perfetti had a really great night here tonight, but you have to remember he worked his way out of the lineup before this. Did he do the right things and be prepared to succeed in this moment? You're damn right he did and give him credit for that. And that's hard for a young player like him to do, but to suggest that this changes everything. And now Tyler Toffoli is going to be out of the lineup or Gabe Velarde will be pulled back out, or maybe uh, uh, Kyle Connor will be pulled out. That's just not the way I see this going. And I think Rick made it pretty obvious in his non answer uh, after the game. Ken. Right. But I mean, who, who else is in the top six competition then to come out? If we're, if we're considering Cole, for I that would spot? say, I would say anyone. That's what I'm saying. I would say at that stage, if you're not getting the prerequisite effort that you need from a Tyler Toffoli or a Nick Ehlers or if players are making mistakes or something like that, that's that's the competition he belongs in. I just think you're trying to shoehorn him into a situation that he doesn't work in on the bottom. So I like like one top six player went out, another top six player came in, and it like if you're trying to spark something, that's what happened here tonight. A new player came in, was hungry, was ready to jump on that opportunity, and you got the spark you were looking here for here tonight. So to me, that's the competition that 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 Cole Perfetti makes sense for. Trying to make a competition that he's it's like either he or Gus or Kapari. To me, it's just not it's just not working. Anyway, just a quick one. I, I don't agree completely with that. I mean, Cole played some of his best hockey of the year with Vladislav Nemesnikov. Now, yes, of course, Nikolai Ehlers was on, on that line. line with Nick Ehlers. Right. Ehlers was driving, but I think that you're shortchanging Vladislav Nemesnikov's skill level, and I know you're not 
necessarily doing that. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. That I think that he has enough. His, I said his skill level looks like something on the second line, but when he's playing alongside Morgan Barron, there's a role that line needs to play first, and you add offense to it afterwards. I don't agree, but I'm just saying he has the creativity. He has the creativity that he can play with Vladislav Nemesikov, and then you have a straight line player in Barron yeah, that can do a lot of the, the same on the fourth line as it looks on the second line. Period. I'm not saying that it is. I'm just saying I, I wouldn't dismiss it outright. Is all I'm saying. I don't well, think it's I'm, as simple I'm as saying he's only available that, for the top six. Is all I'm saying. That I, I'm not. Yeah, and fair enough. That that's that's where we differ. I'm saying right. I don't think that that's working on the fourth line. And and the idea that he was going to go. I know that was the idea. First, the Nemesikov's going to get back there, and they played on the second line. You're going to see this offensive creativity. I don't think we've seen that. I, I we I haven't would, seen it as often. But I, I, I again, I 100 percent know where you're coming from. I would also just counter. Uh, and in terms of the debate, add to add to the debate, I just don't think that Cole was playing with that level of confidence. Now, we, maybe he plays a little bit differently with having a, a little bit of more confidence. But at the same time, I don't think Alex Iafalo is coming out of the lineup anyway because he's on the Jets first. When the Jets are killing penalties, he's the first guy over the boards. Exactly. With and Adam Lowry. Henderson so says this here. Pervetti is better than Iafalo. Better at um, some things, for he's sure. Not, at, hey, at what you saw tonight, most definitely he's better. But that's not what we've seen from Cole Perfetti on the fourth line. And what what the fourth line it has been sent out to do, Alex Iafalo does better than Cole Perfetti. Yeah. Um, no here's something I want to get into on that second line is the play that we saw from Kyle Connor here tonight. I've made this comment before. I think we saw a great example of this here tonight. Um, I've been one of the people who's been saying that, that I thought they should go back to the first line that you see here tonight, but I've also been of the opinion I've stated on this podcast before Kyle Connor is a really good hockey player. And this whole thing where they, he needs to be linked with Mark Shifley. I I've disagreed with this. I I've said this in the past, putting Kyle Connor on a line of his own and, and, on his own is simplifying it because he was on a line with Sean Monahan, who's a great player. And if it wasn't Cole Perfetti on this night, it would be Tyler to Um, but I, I would argue that at the, at his peak, uh, Kyle Connor is the best player on that line when he gets going. And, what I think the Jets have really missed for quite some time is in the pursuit of trying to create two lines. And we've heard Rick talk about this really needing to get two lines going for the playoffs. Why was it never the idea that your two best offensive players in Mark Shifley and Kyle Connor be split up and be the drivers on separate lines. And that, that to me, the whole idea of those two having to be a package deal and being on the same line uh, all the time. I mean, I get that there's been chemistry in the past and I get that the whole Shifley and Connor thing goes way, way back to the Ehlers, uh, sorry, not the Ehlers, to the Wheeler and Shifley and Connor days. Uh, and, 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 and I do think that the two players really want to play with each other. But I'm thinking it is a compliment to Kyle Connor to say, listen, I don't want you playing with Mark because you two are two great offensive players and I think you can drive your own line. I think tonight was a real example of that. I think Kyle Connor took ownership of that line in a way that we have not seen him take ownership of the top line this year. Uh, I thought Sean Monahan followed perfectly along with it. If you're looking for the quick chemistry that Tyler Toffoli hasn't seemed to find when he got here uh, and, and that it took Monahan a couple games to find that you kind of saw Velarde have right away with Shifley. If you're looking for that quick chemistry, you found that tonight, but you also found a version of Kyle Connor that was driving the bus on this line in a way that I don't think we saw him this year. And I think that this is like this to me, I'm fully bought in on exploring the idea of keeping those two apart as the main driving forces between two scoring lines that you've been desperately trying to get going at the same time. I know the top line wasn't going here, but if they can rediscover what they had before and Kyle Connor can keep pushing the way that he did on this line here tonight, I think you have found the two scoring lines that you've been searching for all year. Yeah. I mean, Kyle Connor, three, three assists in 1629. I mean, the one thing with Kyle is that if he's not playing on the top line, his ice time is going to be down. He had two shots on net three attempts. 
Um, you know, I, I'm open to it. I'm just not, I'm not, I don't feel as vehemently as you do about it. Uh, I can be convinced, no doubt. Um, but again, I, I need Nikolai Ehlers to take ownership on that top line before I'm ready to say split them up for good. I mean, I know you're not saying split them up for good, but you're saying give them a longer runway. And if that is the case, uh, this was Kyle's best game in a, in a while. Uh, he still had a couple of uh, hiccups in it for sure, uh, but he was more involved. He was very involved in the offensive zone. Uh, the goal by Sean Monahan was almost all Kyle Connor. Uh, you know, did the in- nice interchange with Josh Morrissey. You know, Morrissey banks it in off the skate of Monahan, but that was a really good shift by Kyle Connor. Uh, I thought he played with more confidence. He was looking for his shot more, even though his attempts are still kind of down relative to what he normally generates. Um, Sorry, again, just I, before you go on, that that redirect off the foot was purposeful on the part of both players. If you watch the re- replay, that's oh, not... I, I didn't... Yeah, no, I, I'm saying that was a smart play by Morrissey to find him, for sure. Yeah. But like, yeah, both, Kyle, both those guys Kyle created exactly the, what they did, yeah. Yeah, I just meant that the, the, the area created to make the play by Morrissey and to have the redirection, uh, that was made by the, you know, the moves up top that, that sort of discombobulated the Kings defensively and, you know, really smart interchange, as I said, and really good job there. But, uh, yeah, I mean, like I said, I, I, I'm not, I'm not here to say that Connor should never play with Shifley. Uh, I think I understand there's a long body of work and everything else and, um, you know, Maybe they'll, you know, could they flourish without one another? It's possible, uh, but we don't, uh, you know, we'll see. Um, okay, we'll see. It is. Uh, Sorry, I, I, I just, I, 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 wanna... I don't, I think there's potential. I like you. I think there's potential for a guy who passes the puck as well as Sean Monahan to really do a great job uh, with Kyle Connor and create openings for him where he can go bar down. Uh, I think Tyler Toffoli, uh, I, I think he's going to come back and look more like the Tyler Toffoli who came in and, you know, produced four ga- four goals in his first five games. Uh, he's been a little quiet of late. Maybe that had to, something to do with him not feeling not 100% or whatever else. But, I mean, that 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 line, Tyler needed to get himself going. Ehlers was carrying that line before too. My argument is, not argument, what I'm saying is Ehlers can also drive that line. But... No matter what happens, Shifley is going to be together with Gabriel Velarde going forward. And, you know, now it's up to those left wingers to show themselves where they're going to land. Um, I just wanted to say uh, th- this to me is a pretty obvious uh, Cambrian uh, payoff uh, in, in making these changes tonight and moving both Cole Perfetti, uh, which was kind of accidental, but for, for the most part, um, Kyle Connor onto that line. I thought it really paid off. And if you're looking to pay off high interest credit cards or debt, we suggest you go talk to our friends at Cambrian Credit Union about their payoff loan. They can show you how taking out a loan to pay off your debt actually gets you debt free faster and you can save thousands of dollars. Go to cambrian.mb.ca to book an appointment online. I think I would also like to give the pristine roofing wake up call to Cole Perfetti in the idea that I think we've talked about it a little bit and I know I asked him about it, but we really should, you know, give the man credit. Give the young man credit. He did a good job sitting out, uh, capitalizing on his opportunity. But part of this opportunity would be the idea that he's fallen out of the lineup because for very real reasons, like I know there's some, listen, we've had lots of conversations with the Cole Perfetti lovers who just want to see opportunity and think he's being mismanaged and don't think any of the things that he's done to not pro- pro- produce are, are his fault or, or that he's being put in a bad spot or whatever. But Cole Perfetti found his way out of the lineup because he stopped producing at the rate that they needed him to produce. And they went out and got players to see if they, who proven that they could produce around the league to take his spot. Um, this was a wake up call for him to step out. And he clearly got that wake up call. Uh, so give him the pristine roofing wake up call. You know what that means. Uh, Time to give North End Rick the pristine roofing wake up call at 1204 981 6289. He's the guy you want to call for all your roofing, siding, and exterior needs. You can also call pristine roofing at 1204 237 7663. Don't forget their pay it forward program in which they're giving away a free roof to someone in need. So if you know someone who fits the bill, make sure you get a hold of them and let them know. And I also wanted to say uh, they are giving away uh, three pairs of tickets to this weekend's home and garden show. 
show. Uh, the Christine roofing, just not the gifts and the gifts and the gifts. Good job by them. Gifts so you know what to do. Giving. If you're interested in going to the home and garden show this weekend, text uh, or get a hold of North End Rick at 1-204-981-6289 as they will be handing out those tickets. Um, Johnson Group, got you covered. Play of the game. What do you got, Ken? Yeah, the shot block by Josh Morrissey on Adrian Kempe, which was the first score, first chance that the Jets uh, surrendered while shorthanded. Or sorry, while they had the power play, they gave up the shorthanded opportunity. A really good job with the stick, but uh, also to shout out to the folks uh, who, who are here to support Ryan Galloway. I know we mentioned it earlier in the show, but uh, folks dressed up and in, uh, in the stripes and the in the crowd wearing number eighty two and showing their appreciation. I thought that was a, a just a great job. Uh, they had Ryan Galloway covered the people, a lot of the people that helped get him, the, get him there. One of those folks would be our main man, Pat Rathwell, who is down there dressed up like that. Good on him. Uh, and yes, Ken, I agree with you on both accounts there. That's great examples of the Johnson group got you covered play of the game. And do you run a small business in Canada? Look to Canada's number one employee benefits plan chambers plan to give you a competitive edge. Chambers plan is the simple, stable, smart choice for over 30,000 businesses countrywide. Visit chamberplan.ca to learn more. And that brings us to your keg save of the game. What do you got? Yeah, in the first minute of the third period, uh, Vladislav Gavrikov had a redirection chance that looked like it was uh, headed to the back of the net, but Lauren Brassois said no. Uh, stood tall, made a big pad save, and I really thought that that helped stabilize him for the third. Um, Benesi Thunderbird, uh, my complaint about Brassois not looking comfortable was not as much to do with the goals allowed, but how he looked in between the goals. Uh, he looked like he was fighting the puck, and that's why I mentioned it. I thought that he was off his game today. Uh, but he was not off his game when he stopped Gavrikov on the redirection, and he was not on his game when he made 11 other saves in the third period uh, to ensure his team was going to walk away with a victory. Uh, Winnipeg Gabriel Vivaldi had the exact, exact same um, uh, suggestion for the keg save of the game. I think I agree. I remember that one. Thought it was great. Uh, so for both of us, that's our keg save of the game. Doesn't matter what we think. Matters what you think. Share with us your keg hashtag the keg save of the game. You're automatically entered to win a $50 gift certificate to any of the three fine keg locations here in the city of Winnipeg. Each location finer than the last. And the winner from our last show, that would be Steve Thompson, Steve Thompson, you know what to do. Direct message me at SN Sean Reynolds, send me your full name and your email. I will have the folks at the keg send you a $50 gift certificate usable at any of the three fine keg locations here in the city of Winnipeg, each location finer than the last. And Ken, what do you got for the lampy, the lamplighter of the game? Well, it's a toss up uh, on the Perfetti goals. I'm going to just go with the uh, GWG. Uh, I think the first goal is probably prettier. Um, sorry, his setup oh, to, prettier? sorry, sorry. The first goal, his setup to Josh Morrissey, I find right. to be probably yeah. prettier. Yeah. Uh, but I, I think that the G, the game winner just based on circumstance, uh, the fact that, you know, the first goal is a complete grinder, good job around the net. And I actually think that, uh, Dylan DeMello does an unreal. I, I think he actually kicks the puck to Perfetti before Cam Talbot can cover it. Uh, but I just think that just given the circumstances of the game and the fact that, uh, you know, Cole started the day wondering if he was on call for Tyler Toffoli and uh, knowing that, you know, when he got to the rink that he was in the lineup and then coming through with the game winner. Um, great shot. It was not a power play goal, but essentially, you know, the Kings player wasn't back uh, into it. So, you know, again, it's your boy, Bruce, Akil, Thomas. Parents got you covered from driving from Toronto for his first NHL game. Uh, love to see the rookie lap there. Sorry to get uh, you know distracted, but uh, I thought I'm going with Perfetti's GWG as my lamplighter today, Sean, even though there were probably, you know, there's a lot of good candidates. Well, no that is a gorgeous, gorgeous shot. Um, yeah. But I, I go with the, the Morrissey goal. Uh, and hey, listen, you'd think I'd want to go with the first uh, Perfetti goal because that's another one of those repeatable goals. Get it to the front of the net. Go hard, grind, get it in there. Um, but, uh, but to the point that I was making at the beginning of the show, I think... The Jets have been getting their grinder goals. They've been getting their tip-ins from the front of the net. Those are all repeatable goals. I'm not worried about the Jets getting repeatable goals at this stage. What I was worried about was them uh, worried for them about was their ability to kind of uh, generate more offense to feel, you know, they, they keep missing these open nets, the kind of passing plays, you know, the creative kind of offense. 
And I think what happens is if you go out and you see, uh, A, I think that that gets the juices flowing for Josh Morrissey, who goes into that spot uh, and buries it. P B, it gets the juices flowing for Cole Perfetti, clearly. And I think the juices going for him kind of gets everyone's juices going because I think if you're Nick Ehlers, if you're Gabe Velarde, if you're uh, any of the other scorers on this team, you're thinking, okay, this kid comes in, he can get it going, we can get it going too. And I think it gets the juices going for uh, Kyle Connor in the way that he was passing it around, making stuff happen. So to me, that is a confidence builder and the gateway to opening up another style of offense that has been missing from the Jets for some time now. So that for me is why that's my hashtag TCB lamp later of the game. Doesn't matter what I think or what Ken thinks it matters what you think. Share with us your lamplighter of the game. You're automatically entered to win a frosty, delicious eight pack of lamplighter amber ale. Brought to you by our friends at Trans Canada Brewing Company. If you can't wait for Kenny and Rennie to gift you your very own eight pack of lamplighter, head on down to their tap room at 11290 Keniston. Uh, you can buy the beers in the store. You can get them on tap, which I find is the most delicious way. Uh, in a great environment with great food, great pizza, great people, uh, which you would know if you were coming to the April 6th, coming up fast, sold out show. It's been sold out for, I think, close to a month now. Uh, the Kenny and Rennie, April 6th, the final live Kenny and Rennie show. It's going to be a gooder. Can't wait to see you all there. Of course, keep in mind, we'll have one more after this. The year ender where we send her will be the biggest sports media party in the city of Winnipeg. It's going to be great. Uh, keep that in mind. We'll let you know when that's going to be. Clearly, that will depend on when the Jets season ends. That means it's time to um, uh, name our lamplighter from last game, and that would be Devin Puccello. Devin Puccello, I saw that you were in the chat room earlier on. Hopefully, you stuck around. You know what to do. Direct message me at SN Sean Reynolds. Send me your full name. Send me an email, and I will send you a voucher for a frosty, delicious, a pack of lamplighter amber ale. Brought to you by our friends at Trans Canada Brewing Company. It is the nectar of the gods, folks. Um, anything to say before we go, Ken? Yeah, we just uh, quickly touch on, uh, we said last, I mean, I think we both said last game that we wanted to see Dylan Sandberg uh, back in the lineup. Not only was he back in the lineup, Sean, today, um, Dylan Sandberg, huge ice time for Dylan in his new pairing with uh, Dylan DeMello, 21.09 on 24 shifts for DeM or for Sandberg. Uh, you, know, you know how I feel about Brendan Dylan and Nate Schmidt. I thought that uh, they were solid together. Um, you know, again, lots of debate about Neil Pionk. I get it. I, I don't. I don't like the way that Neil Pionk kind of blindly rimmed uh, the puck around the boards on the Kevin Fiala goal. Um, but again, the Jets were looking for a spark. They got five points from their defense today, Sean, uh, including the Morrissey goal. So I would say that uh, you're probably going to see that alignment again on Thursday against the Flames, and we'll have to see. Um, see how it works. But I would say it was an important first step for the decor as well. Do I think that this is going to be the game one alignment? I'm not. I'm not saying that by any stretch, but uh, I thought it was important for Dylan Sandberg to get back in and for him to show well in a in a big minute game. Um, I like this comment from Winnipeg Gabriel Vivaldi, who says JMO's smile and acknowledgement of the crowd was uh, what do you call that hand signal? A OK, the A OK hand signal. Um, I agree with this. Uh, I think that there's been you know Josh Morrissey uh, is such a nice guy behind the scenes. Uh, he can be a little zoned in on the ice. So when he had that moment where the crowd was kind of like, I want to see these guys interact with the crowd. I want to see when they get put on uh, like, Hey, Ryan Galloway did a great job of when the, the spotlight was on him interacting with the crowd. I thought to myself, yeah, tapping the heart and doing all that kind of stuff. I thought like the Winnipeg Jets for the most part, who a lot of them come from the school of Blake Wheeler, where it's like sit on the bench, don't change your facial expression, maybe lift your hand up or something like that. I thought, hey, Jets, take a book out of Ryan Galloway's, uh, or sorry, a page out of Ryan Galloway's book. Acknowledge the crowd. This is, they want to give you their their, their love they want to see that you're accepting it and so i thought that that was great for josh morrissey to be interacting with the crowd last thing i want to say before we go i just thought pierre luc dubois was just 
disengaged on this night. Like if you can't come rolling back into town and find a way to try and be one of the most impactful guys on the ice, uh, pointing it out, speaking with the sports net producer, uh, on this night, there was a lot of LA Kings guys who were giving their all. And then he would come out on the next shift. And there was a couple of times I thought he was just taking a pass on his responsibilities out there. I've said this before. I've said this again, but when you're getting paid that kind of money, it should be prerequisite that you find a way to give your all as often as you possibly can. Um, boy, oh boy. I think Pierre-Luc Dubois gave Winnipeg Jets fans an opportunity tonight to be very happy that he no longer plays for the Winnipeg Jets. Um, chat room, great job as you always do tonight, Ken. Great job as you always do. And I want to say this before we do go. Uh, if you do, if any of you do appreciate the conversations that happen in this space, I'd like you to please appreciate the contributions by our sponsors who fight to keep the conversation going in this space. First, that's Vittorio Rossi, Cambrian Credit Union, Sweet Lou Ferlin, the folks at Pristine Roofing, the Johnston Group, the Keg, and of course, Trans Canada Brewing Company. Thank you to all of them. Thank you to all of you. We'll do this all over again on Thursday, correct, Ken? Yes, sir. Flames uh, are in town. Thursday. Flames are in town. I will be, if you're watching on the Flames show, uh, I will be a guest of Ryan Leslie's in the second intermission. Uh, probably won't wear the headband. Uh, oh, there's one thing I wanted to say before I went here because I saw some of these comments. Uh, Rob Mahoney says, Sean is taking his impartiality to a ridiculous level if he won't wear a sweet white suit to let us know he secretly <laughs> loves the Jets as much as we do. I just got to say this. If they're playing the Dallas Stars or the Colorado Colorado Avalanche and I come showing up how seriously am I going to be taken if I am walking around in the garb of a fan in this situation I take my impartiality extremely extremely seriously I always will uh, until the day that I quit this job, I will be a journalist and I will call things as down the middle as I possibly can and root out as any of the impartialities that I may have or any of the biases that I may have. Uh, it is what's required of the job, and I have no problem doing that as part of the job. Thank you, all of you. It's going to be great to see you on Thursday when we do this all over again. Bye-bye.